a form of godliness. We must not defile the church by having close fellowship with people who claim to be Christians, but who persistently live out of harmony with God's will. Here now is Gene Getz. Now to understand this principle and how it emerges from the book of Jeremiah, we've got to understand that the church is not a building. The church is a family. The church is people. The church are those people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Church buildings have come into existence, but that's not the church. That's not what the New Testament is talking about. Now, once you understand that, then you need to go back to the Old Testament situation, the time at which Jeremiah was prophesying. Because in the Old Testament, there was a temple. There was a building where God revealed Himself. For example, Solomon's temple. It was a building. And in that building, within the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was placed, God at times would reveal Himself in a very special way. In fact, when that temple was completed, God came with such power and with such a cloud that they all had to remove themselves because they couldn't even see God's power was revealed in that building. Now, before that, there was the tabernacle, the tabernacle in the wilderness, where God instructed them to build this tent, and it was transportable. In fact, it was transportable to various places during the time prior to the building of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, with that background, uh, this will help you understand what uh, Jeremiah was prophesying. And I've called this first point meaningless chanting. Now, this is quite amazing. And yet, it happens even today. And here's what Jeremiah said. Do not trust deceitful words chanting. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. These are those people that were committing this horrible evil. And they walk into the temple and they believe because they stand there and say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, they're going to be overlooked in judgment. And then they could go right on in their sinful behavior. The next point I want to point out is I've called it pagan magic. And here's what the Lord said to Jeremiah. Do you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal? Which they did. They did all these things. And follow other gods that you have not known, which were not gods, but they thought they were. Then you come and stand before me in this house, the temple, called by my name and say, we're delivered so we can continue doing all these detestable acts. Incredible. That is really deterioration. Manipulating God. They don't want to know the truth, but they still want to hang on to God and say, you know, He'll forgive us for all this evil because we just simply chant, this is the temple, this is the temple, this is the temple. That's an incredible story. And so we have a warning right here in Jeremiah verses 14 to 15 in chapter 7. What I did to Shiloh, I will do to the house that is called by my name. The house in which you trust. And he just described that. Come into that house, and you think because you're in that house, and you go through these rituals, that God's going to forgive you, even though you continue in your sin. Let me give you a running start on that. What I did to Shiloh, I'll do to the house that is called by my name, the house in which you trust, that is the temple, the place that I gave you and your ancestors. I will drive you from my presence just as I drove out all of your brothers, all the descendants of Ephraim. And there when he says the descendants of Ephraim, that's a phrase that is used to refer to all the northern tribes that were taken into Assyrian captivity because of their sin. That's already happened when Jeremiah was prophesying. It has not yet happened to Judah, but God says it's going to happen to you as well. You're going into Babylonian captivity. 
Now, when he says what I did to Shiloh, you see, they would understand that if they knew biblical history because this was during the time of Samuel, when Samuel was brought to Shiloh, dedicated to the Lord. Eli was the priest. He had two sons. Their names were Hopni and Phineas, And they were priests. They were so evil that when people brought their sacrifices, they would take the best of the meat for themselves rather than give it to the Lord. We read very specifically, they committed fornication with the women who were serving in the temple. They were very, very evil people. And what happened was the Philistines came against them. And so Hopni and Phinehas thought, whoa, if we just take the ark of the Lord and go out against these people, God will deliver us in spite of our sin. You see the magic? They're using the ark like magic. Well, what happened was the Philistines defeated them, stole the ark, destroyed the tabernacle probably there in Shiloh because of their evil sins. And the sad thing is their father Eli was sitting on a bench waiting for news. He was a very heavy man and when he heard his two sons were killed that he had not stopped from this evil, he fell over backwards and broke his neck. A really sad story, isn't it? But that's what basically Jeremiah is saying or what God is saying through Jeremiah that what I did at Shiloh, I'm going to do to you. And relationship to now is the permanent temple that you've built. Because you think, because if you go into this house and go through these rituals, that you'll be delivered. Well, the fact is that I started with the fact that if we, we have to understand that today, under the new covenant, we're the temple. We're the sanctuary. And we read about this in Ephesians one place or others, the whole building, and that's a metaphor. It's not talking about a house or a building. It's a metaphor of us. The whole building being put together by Him, that is Jesus, grows into a holy sanctuary. We are the sanctuary. We are the tabernacle. We are the house, the building. You also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. Now think about what has happened in churches today where they believe if they go to this building, and of course the great cathedrals came into existence throughout the Roman era, the Middle Ages. We go, there's where God is. We go in there, we confess our sins, we go through some rituals, we walk out the door, and we continue to do what we did. By the way, that's what Martin Luther was very, very upset about, which launched the whole Protestant Reformation. All of that ritual, all that false teaching. In a sense, that sounds like Judas, doesn't it? Which has crept into Christianity periodically throughout the ages, and even in our lives if we're not careful. We are the sanctuary of God. Now, God does discipline that, and that's what this principle is all about. Reflection and response. How can we be Christ's witness in this world and yet obey Paul's exhortation to Timothy to avoid these people? And he says this when he wrote to the Corinthians, a very carnal church. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, you realize that these Corinthians were converted out of horrible immorality. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you'd have to leave the world. That's not why you're called. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt. You're to be in the world, but not a part of the world. And then he goes on to explain. He said, but now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, who's sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. What he is talking about here 
is participation, fellowship with people who are living out of the will of God. And Paul's saying that's not possible as far as God is concerned. These are the people that we need to avoid. Hopefully that they will come back to the Lord. But overall, we're to be light in this world. We're to be salt of the earth. And that's a very significant uh, principle. We are to participate, but not participate in their godly activities or condone it. Jesus did that. He ate with the sinners. He ate with evil people. But in the midst of that, he never compromised truth, and he told them who he was. And so my final thought is, we need a lot more Christians in the world who are not a part of the world in order to be people of the book who share the truth of Jesus Christ. Well, let me repeat the principle. We must not defile the church by having close fellowship with people who claim to be Christians but who persistently live out of harmony with God's will.